Uh, so let's talk about MongoDB, Mongo database. Uh, so I'm going to have a couple presumptions in my, in my presentation. I'm mostly talking about dedicated systems. So that means that you're running just MongoDB on whatever OS you're running, whether it's, a, whether it's bare metal or wh whether it's in a container. It's not your MongoDB and also your mail server and also your web server and also where you're doing you know, whatever else you're doing. right? Um, and then I will be mostly talking about replica set or sharded cluster. I'll get into it a little bit more. They're essentially the same thing. If you're a DBA, there are definitely differences, and you need to think about them. Um, but uh, sharded clusters are pieces of a, of a database that you've split up, and they become basically little replica sets. sets. Well, not necessarily little. Depends on the size of your database. Right? OK. So what is a replica set? It is three or more MongoD. Now, technically, you can have two with an arbiter, but if you care about performance, have three. <laughs> so I'm not even going to talk about arbiters, right? OK, so uh, you're going to have three or, f three or more MongoD, uh, and it is a replica of the same data on all three uh, uh, shards, or all three servers. That way, if one goes away, you still have your data and some other things in there. Uh, if you mo want more about that, go to a MongoD talk. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about get underneath that for the OS. Uh, each has a copy of the data. Uh, one primary is taking the writes. Uh, but you can read from the secondaries depending on how you set up your queries. Um, and then the secondaries take write from the primary. Technically, one secondary can feed the other secondary, but we'll, we'll go for the basic. A sharded cluster is like a bunch of replica sets. So let's take the, the phone book, right? So you can have A through E and whatever the next five and whatever the next five, and then three of them from the books, right? Mac, you have to have extra for the books. He's not paying attention. All right. Um, so you, they're like that, so, but each shard has three or more, just like we had with the replica set. Uh, and again, you have multiple copies. Again, you're talking to a primary for writes to the replica set, but you can also read from the, from the uh, secondaries in the replica set. Um, you have, end up with proxies. Prox, uh, you, uh, you have proxies in front of your, your shards uh, that route the queries. So your application doesn't need to go, oh, I need to go talk to each of these guys. It just says, I'm going to go talk to MongoDB. Your application still is, is doing that. And then the, the proxies, the Mongo S, go through and figure out which shard to talk to, or which shards, depending on what your query is. Uh, but one of the, the goals for the sharding is that you limit the number of shards you need to talk to by being able to restrict stuff down. Uh, shards can be hotspots, uh, especially if you're writing. Uh, so we see that on a regular basis where we need to go re-index or re-shard uh, because we finally suddenly hit a whole bunch as I was bringing up the MOOCs. You might end up with a whole lot of MOOCs because you end up with MC and MAC and whatever else. There's a lot of you peoples out there. Um, so you might need to split those up into multiple shards as opposed to just like one letter per shard and stuff like that. And of course, splitting by, by name is actually a really bad way of, of indexing, but you know, it's, it's something I can explain quickly. Um, and then, as I say, the queries might or might not hit each of the different shards. Uh, and the, the Mongo S can actually aggregate things together and, and do some stuff on the proxy side. Yes, Mac. So um, playing with a, a test Mongo cluster earlier this year, actually, mm -hmm. and um, the, the big debate at the table was sharding by time, right? And the, the two schools of thought of absolutely no way in hell will you ever shard by time, and sharding by time is the only thing that's really reliable because time is the single constant, you know, evenly distributed. Um, yeah you know, measure. So I just wanted to ask you, since you run large MongoDBs, about your, mm -hmm. you know, why and why not. OK. So the main thing for that is the MongoDB, the OID that MongoDB will create by default, unless you tell it some other index, is actually time-based. So it has time inside of it. Um, and so you get that distribution. But it's also got time with randomness. So you end up being able to, to split stuff out. Jo yes, Joseph is not perfect. Uh, and you need to test with what your actual data set is and a lot of other things. Um, the big thing with time, if, you're, if you are reading a lot, that might work. If you're writing a lot, that means that whatever the most recent time is is going to be hot shard because everything's going into that one place. So you know, in our case, we've got customers with uh, 70 shards or more, right? So if the amount, imagine the amount of data they've got to have in order to have 70 shards all with a couple hundred gigs in them. If I'm writing all of that into one database, 
you know, unless I'm writing a dev null, it ain't going in fast enough. Great. Okay. Yeah. This is probably getting edge casey down into the weeds, but especially in a large cluster, how susceptible is that? What problems do you have with clock drift? Uh, so we'll talk about it. Uh, it is it is not susceptible with clock drift because you run MTP and NTPD everywhere. <laughs> you have when NTP snoots, right? Like you have bad connectivity to. Yeah. I'm thinking databases I have run in parts of the world that they're literally it's short of buying your own clock. There mm -hmm. literally exists no super good time options. Well, South America, parts of yeah. Asia. So with those, the main thing is they need to be on the same time, right? Now I haven't done any testing to see if if I set them up in 1964, what happens? Right. right. So you would set up a local NTP. But you want to have everything. Whatever you're doing, yeah, for databases, uh, any of the databases I've ever worked with, you want to have a local time server, multiple local time servers, um, and make sure they're all on the same time, uh, regardless of what that time is. Preferably, it's the correct time because it causes issues, right? Um, but uh, the main thing is you want to keep them all in the same. Uh, new stuff I'm going to be working with at work where we're distributed inter-globally, ah, it's going to be fun. But, you know. So anyway, so every component for MongoDB should be running NTP and then coming back upstream to the same uh, uh, time source. All right. Daemons. So we're, we're, run, we're, we're running on Unix, Linux. We have daemons. We have th processes that are doing things and looking at stuff and taking taking requests for us. MongoD is the, the data server. So that's actually where all the data is. Those are big, lots of disk and stuff like that. Um, oops, I, my, my comment didn't get hidden like it's supposed to, but all right. Uh, so TCP connections. So MongoD in a uh, sharded server doesn't take that many TCP connections. We'll get into what, what it is taking in a second. Um, still a lot, but compared to like active web servers and a whole bunch of other things, it's not really taking that much. Um, if it is the replica set, or if it's a replica set as opposed to a sharded server, then it's taking all the, app, the uh, connections from the application as well. So it depends on how, much, how many connections you're bringing from your application. So you might want to boost those up. Even on a sharded server, you probably want to boost those up a little bit over your defaults. Uh, but it's not so much. Uh, lots of network I.O. <laughs> you're moving a lot of data in, in general, right? If, you're, if you care about performance. If you're not moving that much data, you don't care about the performance so much. You're not doing that much, right? Uh, lots of disk I.O. You're moving a lot of data in and out. Um, uh, and one of the things, though, is that MongoD, uh, so I'm going to talk about some settings in a second. Uh, but if you start MongoD up and you don't have some of the settings they recommend, they'll tell you. So uh, one we get on all of our servers, because we're running on uh, OpenVZ, is MongoD comes up and goes, oh my gosh, you're running on OpenVZ. That's really not a good idea. We've been doing it for seven years. It's been wor working wonderfully for us. So you know that we, we, we beg to differ. Uh, and we can actually turn that off, but we, we leave it for fun, I guess. I don't know. Um, so anyway, but it'll, so some of the settings that's com coming in here, MongoD will actually tell you about those. Hey, you might want to go change the setting when you bring it up. So look at those, look at the uh, suggestions and see if they're, they're worth listening to. So Mongo S is the, is the proxy. Uh, and uh, those take a lot of TCP connections depending on how you're setting it up. One of the reasons is they have to talk to every shard and they have to talk to every node in every shard. And you usually have more than one connection to each of those things. So in our cases where I've got, again, 70 shards times three, I've already got 210 connections. Even if I just had one apiece, I don't. So we end up having to boost up the, the uh, open connections and stuff like that. Uh, again, you're doing lots of network I.O. because you're moving a lot of data back and forth. Uh, but you're not really talking to the disk. Um, you can, we'll get to this in a, in a little bit, uh, but especially you could end up writing a lot of logs. We'll, we'll get into those. Uh, I mentioned Arbiter earlier. Uh, there's also config servers that the Mongo S goes through, and, and basically it's a sharded, or it's a replica set that has the, the configuration. They don't really do much. Uh, um, you know, you could, you could run those on a Raspberry Pi along with doing some other things on them, right? Um, but uh, I wanted to mention them. Uh, and then for your app servers, so the application side, again, you're going to have TCP connections going to your Mongos, uh, and, it, and you can have multiple Mongos. So you have your TCP connections going to, to the, the, the database. Uh, and again, 
moving lots of, net, of, of uh, data back and forth. Uh, and then whatever, of course, your application is doing. So, um, but for the Mongo side of things, you need to make sure you can get, get plenty of uh, connections and that you've got significant bandwidth. All right, so MongoD tuning. Uh, so U-Limit on uh, Linux is great for a lot of different things. Um, but in general, especially if you're using hardware for, for MongoD, we want to up the number of, of uh, connections and so forth. And we want to go unlimited for a lot of different things. Again, I'm presuming you're running Mongo, and that's the only thing you're running on the, on the server. Well, it's not the only thing we get. Minor demons and stuff like that. But as far as your workload goes, you're not running MongoDB and MySQL on the same server. Please don't do that. All right. Um, so uh, you want to go unlimited for memory, for uh, uh, CPU time, uh, all those things so that MongoDB can get all the resources that it, that it wants, right, that are available. Um, you need to up your open files. Uh, I think our open files are actually like 32,000, even with, with those uh, servers that have, have tens of thousands of connections. Um, but you can take those as high as, as is practical. You're using a little bit of memory, so you don't want to make those quite unlimited. Uh, you also want, don't want something to really, really run away uh, on, your, on your system. Same thing with the processes and threads. Uh, for memory, now here's an, this is an important one. So general in four databases, whether it be MongoDB, MySQL, Postgres, whatever you're doing, you want to turn your swappiness down as much as possible. Now up until a few years ago, the, the recommendation was always to turn swappiness to zero. What swappiness is, is how much is the kernel going to try to swap things out? And the lower means the less, right? So we don't want, we want to keep things in memory. We don't want to put things on the swap partition. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a kernel bug so that if swappiness was set to zero, it read that as like infinite or something like that. So it's trying to swap everything, which is the opposite of what you want for a database. Um, so if you set it to one, it'll say swap as little as possible, but it won't hit that bug. So that's what we're recommending for, for MongoDB. And as I say, really for any other database uh, or any large database, I don't, I don't know. Uh, there's, we've got a couple of... Uh, of smaller instance type of things that might not matter so much. Uh, and then dirty ratio and dirty background ratio is how much dirty memory do you have? How much memory that where something has changed in memory but you haven't written it to disk yet? So in a database we want to get that to disk fairly soon. Um, so we want to turn those ratios down a little bit so that we're writing that out. Presumably if you're putting data in a database you wanted to keep it, let's put it on disk so that it sticks around. Um, in general, for MongoDB, it doesn't support NUMA. Uh, and so it says disable NUMA. Uh, I talked to one of our DBAs today. We actually have NUMA turned on, but we're doing something else. So I think we've got NUMA set up for the, the containers, and then MongoDB is still doing its thing. Um, but it, 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 MongoDB doesn't understand the, the, the stuff. Uh, so generally, we want to turn that off. Uh, and then uh, Red Hat added a feature a couple of years ago. Uh, not picking on them, just saying that that's where it is, uh, where they added this huge pages feature. Uh, and again, MongoDB doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, work with it. So you want to disable that if you're running on uh, RHEL 6 or RHEL, starting RHEL 6? RHEL, is it RHEL 5? Okay. It's available in other distros, so you have to enable it. Okay. So maybe that was what it is, is they started enabling it. It's in the kernel. It's oh, just yeah. defaulted on active on Red Hat. Yeah. Okay. But almost any <coughs> large data store, whether it's Elasticsearch or Mongo or even large Redis actually implementations, don't you know when it drops to disk, they don't want transparent these pages. So yep. So go through and turn that off. Uh, so disk. Uh, so read ahead is a really cool feature that the Linux kernel has that says, hey, I've got this piece of data I want to get. I go out to the disk and I find it. And I say, you know, most likely you're going to want the, the piece of data next to it. So you go and read the next, next bit as well, right, or chunk. Uh, MongoDB is mostly doing a bunch of random data seeks and writes. Uh, so reading that extra bit of data is actually wasting memory. So we want to turn the read, read ahead down uh, uh, fairly well. Most of the documentation was recommending against turning it off altogether. Uh, so they were saying rec turn it down to 8, eight or 32 or something like that. Uh, cache, uh, I forget what it's going to do. Forget what it's gonna do. 
Uh, isolate your MongoDB database data directory. So one, <laughs> uh, you don't want some OS type of thing causing uh, a bind on, on your, uh, uh, writing for your reading writing for your database. Uh, but also, uh, you might want to be able to split those up. I'll talk, to those, talk about that in a, in a bit. Um, but anyway, so have a different database directory, different partition minimally, but ideally you would have different disks for that versus your OS. Uh, for your scheduler, for your elevator, you want to use um, uh, NoOp on virtual machines and uh, my notes are hidden. Um, uh, not the default uh, elevator. What is it? Um, spacing on the name. Go look it up. But main thing is you want to change. You want to change that. Um, so and then uh, as of MongoDB 4.0, they're requiring journaling. And journaling, again, is one thing you might want to put on different spindles, right? So journaling, depending on how heavy you're writing and stuff like that, maybe it goes on the same as the OS, but you want to be different than data if you can. Uh, and ideally, you would have that as, as a separate set of spindles altogether. Uh, and then I'm going to mention it later on, but logs. And we'll, we'll get to logs. All right, file system. So for Wired Tiger, MongoDB says XFS. Just do it. Don't do anything else. Um, for MMAP, they're like, you can use X, the XT4, but don't. So they're saying XFS. One of the reasons for XFS is it is more configurable, so you can do more things with it. Yes, Mac. No op? <coughs> uh, scheduler? No, no op is scheduler is what you want for virtual machines. Um, and it's like eight characters, starts with an N. No. <laughs> for, for, the, for the physical machine. Um, one of the things with, with uh, MongoDB is it requires the fsync operator or uh, function. Uh, so in Linux, that basically means ext4 and xfs. Uh, it means no hdfs and a bunch of other things for Mac. Um, so that's, that's part of the reason for that. Uh, and then turn off a time. So a time is your access time. The default for Linux changed recently. I didn't know this. Uh, recently being like 15 years ago. Um, <laughs> so it's not going through and changing. Uh, so every time you look at a file, a time would say, oh, go update when that file was last looked at. Uh, so if, I, if you write a script that says 4i in cat whatever, right? Um, every time you cat that file would go update a time. Uh, the default is now go update it every once in a while if I haven't updated it recently. Um, but for MongoDB, for the data directory, just turn it off. It, it's your data. You're accessing it. You don't need the, the a time. Leave your M time alone, but don't, don't worry about the A type. No, okay. Uh, they, the documentation re suggests RAID 10. Uh, so you get redundancy. You get a uh, 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 duplicate, so you get extra speed. Um, they, they recommend against RAID 0. My DBA is like, Psh, RAID 0. <laughs> you get all your speed. You've got multiple copies of your data you know, through, through your shards, through your replica sets. If you're not certain about those, You've got a different issue, so uh, go through and if you, if you're th okay, three is not enough to be certain, make four, five, right? Now if you do, talk to your DBAs about how you do elections to see who becomes the primary, um, but go ahead and do, do uh, uh, lots of copies. So you can have an even number of shards. You can have or an even, even number of copies. You can have an even number, but you you basically need to make sure that something is not voting. So, and, and even if you do an odd number for, for voting, you need to make sure it's certain odd numbers and stuff like that because, you know, you know like, uh, uh, well, we'll, well, let's get out in the weeds. But you want to make sure that you can have a majority that say, this is the person to talk, this is the primary. Uh, because if they start having questions about that, then nobody does nothing. So you can have as many replicas as you want, but you still need to deal with all the standard core on issues. Yeah. So yeah. I guess my question is, is, then does Mongo give me options to basically ensure that my primary shard, like, like say I have multiple copies, mm -hmm. that my primary copies of each set um, you know, are evenly distributed across my cluster so that I don't end up with all my primary shards on one system, and then ideally that would be my first Does it search. have like regional replication yeah. or doesn't So have? MongoDB doesn't do that. There's other ways. I'll get to, to, uh, to awareness later on. Um, but no, so MongoDB doesn't have that for the, for the primaries. Um, one of the things on that is if you do end up to where 
you've put all of your shards on virtual machines on the same boxes. One, don't do that so much. But two, <laughs> two monitor. So if you need to, you can go kick one and say, you know, stop being the primary and go over there. Sorry, yeah. Kubernetes. Yeah. Yes. Kubernetes fixes all. Oh, no. Um, never mind. All right. Uh, NF, if you're using NFS for your data share, uh, it's got a couple things in here. I'm not a fan of that, but you can. Um, again, you want a data partition. Uh, as I mentioned, you want a log partition. One of the things with a log partition is you think, okay, we're not doing that many logs. If you look at normal MongoDB, day in, day in the life of, they really don't spit out that many logs for the amount of traffic you're doing. But if one of your nodes goes away, oh my God, they're like Encyclopedia Britannica every three seconds. Blah, blah. The entirety of Wikipedia. It, 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 is, it is worse than a three-year-old. Is it up yet? Is it up yet? Is it up yet? Is it up yet? Like 10,000 times a second. So if, if you have a node go down, you will be writing gigs of data in a couple minutes. Um, and if you need to look at those logs to figure out things, you're running out of space, they're gone, you can't find things. So uh, plan for the log floods. I haven't found a way to turn that off. The DBAs have said, yeah, we just deal with it. Uh, log to dev null. Some people have know this cool thing called elastic search. I don't know. It's, it's like this, this thing where you put logs somewhere else. It's, it's a rumor. I don't know if it really happens, but yeah. <laughs> like a log stash module or something? Yeah, you can, so you can like throw them somewhere else. Uh, but if you're, if you're logging locally, uh, you will easily write 8 to 10 gigs of, of logs in you know, 20, 30 minutes. Uh, so keep in, mind, keep in mind with that. Also, if you get a bunch of slow queries, which is also easy to have happen, you can also be throwing quite a bit to logs uh, that way. Uh, which also means you don't want to ignore logs because you want to see those and hopefully go fix indexes and stuff. Or applications. All right, tuning the network. Big thing with this is make it bigger, make it smaller. Depends on different things. Um, so uh, you want to be able to, to increase the, the amount of, of uh, stuff you're coming in. The keep alives, they, they recommend taking those down. Depends on how you set things up. So we've got an environment where we are taking tens of thousands of connections from the application, distributed across 30 Mongos, but each Mongo is still taking thousands of connections from the application. If we have short time keep lives between the Mongos and the MongoDs, then all our machines do is start and stop connections. They don't actually get to do anything. They're just like, oh, I need another 500 connections, right? So we actually increased our keep alive to like greater than 24 hours to keep that minimum set of connections up between our Mongos and MongoDs uh, on that. And, and it's, uh, I think we've set it up to 100 plus uh, is the minimum connection across, like I say, 70 some uh, MongoDs. So we're, we're uh, got a decent amount of connections just sitting around on, on those servers. But if we don't, when they slam us, we're too slow to be able to react. Right? Um, you know, back in the day, for those of you who remember, uh, um, I can't even remember what it was called, but uh, the thing that would start your TCP services for you, and when web daemons first came out, they're like, oh, you, we can just do that for web servers, and we'll just spin it up when you have, get a web page request come in, right? Well, that, that turned into a bad idea real quick, right? Uh, now, one thing, uh, I didn't play with this myself, and I didn't uh, talk to our DBA team, but max incoming connections, I actually want to investigate this, because we do get incoming floods from some of our customers where all of a sudden there's a problem on their application side and they open up 10 or 50,000 connections to us. Actually, they open up, uh, yeah, 50,000 connections uh, suddenly. <laughs> um, so uh, we need the, 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 the connection stack to be pretty big, but we might be able to say, okay, you can't open more than you know, 1,000 connections to us, uh, to, to each of our Mongos in a, in a short period of time. Uh, and then their application will back off. So the nice thing is I'm pretty certain they're set up to where if that actually happens, their application will go, oh, I've got to stop making so many connections. It's usually there's something bad, you know, uh, mis misbehaving on their application side. Um, although it can also happen because one of our shards is having an issue and we're backing up. But the best option is still for the data to come in slower while we go through and fix whatever the issue is or they fix whatever their issue is. In general. All right. 
Uh, CPU, more cores is better than faster cores. So you know, if you can get 300 Pentium 2s, no. <laughs> but uh, Wired Tiger, uh, so if you're, if you're using MMAP, not as much of a, an advantage. But Wired Tiger now is, is, uh, understands, uh, is multi-threaded, understands multiple cores. So if you've got a lot of stuff going on, um, generally you want to have more cores in order to be able to isolate each of those threads and let them go off and do stuff. Uh, do turn off your dynamic speed. You want the CPUs, just run it. So uh, you know, let, let them run full out the whole time um, because you don't want to have to wait for your CPU to ramp up uh, for uh, when you get slammed. Uh, the AES and I extension for CPUs, so they've got, got support for that in the hardware, gives you some performance uh, improvements for encryption. Some people in our group like encryption and think it's a good thing. Um, and then, of course, nowadays for database, you should use SSD. Um, but if you need to, spinning drives do work, uh, and uh, you can use those. All right, as mentioned earlier, NTPD on every node. Just make sure they're going through. Now, if you're running a, a containerized system, your NTPD might be running on your host system as opposed to each node within the containerized system. But you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you're keeping your time in sync uh, fairly good. Uh, and as uh, my DBA pointed out earlier today, have multiple sources. So if something goes down. Uh, but the key is keep all the MongoD processes on the same time. OK. Uh, MongoDB configuration. So we're not really talking about things from the, the database side, but there was a couple things I thought were important to bring up for the systems people. Uh, so document compression. MongoD will do, uh, uh, or um, not MongoDB, uh, Wired Tiger will do uh, compression for you. The default is called Snappy. Um, and uh, it does fairly well. Uh, but it, there's also Zlib available, so our, our normal Zlib stuff. Um, but Zlib uses a lot more resources, and uh, so generally that's recommended against doing that. Um, but as of MongoDB 4.2, there's a new uh, option which is called ZSTD, and um, it gives you better compression than Snappy, but does use a little bit more CPU. So you need to look again at what your trade-off is. Do you want to get less space because you've got some CPU to give? If you don't have any CPU to give, give space, right? Um, and then less than 4.2, use Snappy. Uh, index compression, uh, so this is something that's separate. So you've got your indexes for all of your data, so you can find things. Uh, indexes do prefix compression, um, and we don't need to know too much about it other than that it's different than our, our data compression. Uh, and then the index compression stays in RAM. So we can, the, when MongoDB searches the index, it can actually search the compressed values. It doesn't need to decompress them in order to search the index. All right, Mongos. So uh, limits, again, we want to really boost up the user processes. We'll get to that in a second. Processes, we need more of them. Um, anyway, the uh, sharding task executor pool min size is the minimum number of uh, uh, Mongos that you're going to have, or uh, um, connections you're going to have to each of your nodes. Uh, so you need that times your shards times the nodes per shard as a minimum for your number of connections. Of course, usually if you're taking a lot of data, that's going to go up as you get more uh, uh, um, queries coming in. Uh, Mongo's tuning for, for you limit. Again, we want to boost these things up for the most part. Mongo's should be the only thing that's running on that server. Right? Even if it, it, on the you know, virtual virtualization, might be the, you might have much of multiple virtual machines running on a uh, brick. But you want to make sure that within that, that uh, uh, virtualized container that Mongoose is getting all the resources that are available. That's the thing that's running on there. Connections, again, for, for TCP, we want to go through and increase the amount of, of connections we can bring in. Um, normally, you want time, uh, your keep lives down. But, but as, as, as I gave as an example for us, we have instances where we need to keep those, uh, those keep lives up and just take a little bit of a hit. Uh, tuning. Same thing, we want more, more cores for the most part. Turn off dynamic speed, we get advantages for uh, hardware encryption. NTP everywhere. All right, let's talk about virtualization. I had a question about awareness. How do we keep things around it? So if I've built a brick, right? I've got a, I've got a host machine, and I've got 400,000 
containers on there or whatever. I got 40 containers. And I put, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a replica set, and I put all three copies of the replica set on the same brick. Does that work really well? Yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping that was <laughs> for Jesus, right? No, so what happens if, if that brick ceases to exist, I lose all the copies of the data, right? You've got backups, backups are good, production tests of backups are bad. <laughs> so um, we want to make sure that uh, when uh, we're, we're setting up our environment that the, the copies, of the, the different copies within that replica set are on different bricks. Ideally, we've got them in different cabinets and some other things like that. Uh, so your, your, your deployment tool needs to, to have that rack awareness to make sure that you're, you're keeping those, those nodes separate. Uh, storage, choose reliable, fast storage op options in, in virtualization. Uh, I'll talk about this in a second. There are some, a couple different uh, uh, storage options that for normal services are, are probably fine, but they're not uh, consistent. And the databases like consistent storage, and they want like it to be as fast as, as practical. Actually, as fast, as fast as practical. They want it as fast as possible. They don't care about practical. They're databases. All right, uh, memory over commitment. So this is where uh, you know, Linux uses the airline model for memory. You know, the airline says, I got 300 seats, I'll sell 350, and just hope 50 people don't show up, or presume they won't, right? Uh, however they, whatever numbers they use. So memory, the Linux kernel, when you ask for memory, application asks for memory, the kernel will say, yep, oh, here's some memory. Doesn't, doesn't even check, just here you go, right? Um, the presumption is that a lot of applications are asking for memory don't actually need all that memory, and they don't need it right now. Uh, the example that's given, uh, and, and, and just because you know, Joseph's there, we'll, we'll have fun with Java now. Um, but when you fork, you end up forking and saying, I need all the memory the parent process had. But if you're forking and dropping all that, you don't need to go, give me a copy of that 25 gigs of memory, and then get rid of it. So the, the kernel says, well, here's a thing, and I'll pretend to give you 25 gigs of memory, and we'll pretend it's there, but they do a copy on write. So basically, you're still pointing at the original 25 gigs, and you only get memory if something changes in your new process. Um, so uh, that's really cool feature, but for databases, not so good because databases, want they're greedy. They want the memory. They're going to use the memory. Well, they want it even if they're not going to use it. So um, you want to go through and make sure that you uh, map out and reserve the full amount of memory for your database. Uh, there are some other some other uh, uh, side effect effects if you disable memory over commitment for, for Linux. So rather than disabling it, just make sure that on your database systems, you've gone through and mapped out and, and reserved that memory for the, for the database. KVM has memory over commitment issue to, to make sure you take care of. Uh, so, if, uh, so does uh, OpenVZ. I, I commented out that slide, sorry, but it's the same thing. Um, AWS, uh, you want to choose enhanced networking, right? Data is a database. It wants the best. So you want to go through and get the enhanced networking. Extra hand-holding. I don't know what it is. All right. Uh, provisioning IOPS. Uh, and then do not use ephemeral IOPS. This is the thing I was talking about where you get some stuff where, where your disk isn't quite as, as uh, um, consistent. Uh, ephemeral IOPS, I, I guess, is the normal. But it, it, for a database, you want to make sure we've got a good solid connection. Uh, D disable DVFS and CPU power saving modes. Database should be running full full throttle all the time. Uh, disable hyper threading in AWS, uh, and then bind memory lo locality to a single socket. So keep keep your memory local as well. Uh, for Azure, choose the premium storage. Just gotta use the good stuff, uh, and then adjust your TCP idle timeout uh, to something appropriate. Uh, VMware also has the memory over commitment, so make sure you go through, through that. And then look at your affinity, affinity rules. This also goes back to the keeping all your primaries off the same uh, um, brick. Uh, look at your uh, affinity rules uh, for your VMX CPUs to make sure you're, get, you're getting your separation like you want. Uh, backups for going through and doing uh, uh, configuration for that, you're moving a lot of data. Right? <laughs> You've got MongoDB, generally because you've got a lot of data. 
I know some people talk about larger data sets, but for you know, most of us mere mortals, uh, you're moving a lot of data. Uh, your backup server is also going to be moving a lot of data and storing a lot of data. Uh, if you have a large database, depending on what your environment is, um, then you might want to have a Mongoose that's dedicated to backups rather than going through and, and conflicting with your app servers in order to get data out of your MongoDBs. Uh, for compactions, now let me go into MongoDB land a little bit. Um, so last month we talked a little bit about how MongoDB is, is, is storing documents. And basically it says, okay, here's a, here's a slot where I can put a document. Um, and uh, it finds a space and throws, throws the document in there. The space is probably a little bit bigger, not an exact fit. And as it does that over and over again, you end up with small documents and large spaces uh, on, on the disk. Um, and you also end up with empty spaces that aren't getting cleaned up. Just part of the way the, doc the document system works. Uh, especially with MMAP, uh, Wired Tiger has a little bit less issue with that. Uh, so one of the things that you do with MongoDB on a, a fairly regular basis in a write-heavy environment, where you're changing things a lot, is you do compactions. And basically you know, what a compaction is, it says take one of the secondaries out. So you're now down to, you know, in a normal environment, you're down to two, two servers. Take a secondary out, wipe out your data, and make a new copy of it. So go, go grab a new copy of everything from there. And then it'll go through and try to write it more efficiently. And you end up saving a lot of space by doing that. Uh, and it improves other uh, uh, parts of the end. You're not just saving space, but you're also uh, uh, increasing throughput for data and so forth by doing that as well. And then you do the other secondary. And then when those are both done, you do a step down on the primary, and, which becomes a secondary, and you do it there. So you end up doing that as, as your compaction cycle. Um, but your op log is basically your log of all the things that have changed since, you know, whatever. So if you take a secondary out, wipe out your data, and it takes 20 minutes to read your op, to, to, to copy the data back over, and you've only got 10 minutes of op log, that means you've, you've, you've lost 10 minutes worth of data. So you need to make sure your op log is big enough to go through and do a recovery. Now, you can say, well, I don't need compactions. We'll just go without them, right? Well, what happens if you lose a node, right? Just because the brick fell over or something else happened, if you need to be able to go through and stand up another secondary, or if you just want to add another, a fourth secondary, if your op log isn't big enough, you can't ever get there because you copy data over, and by the time you do, you've already run out of, you, you know, you're, you're missing data. So, uh, the DBA team should be watching this, and they do, but I've found that sysadmins tend to like, be a little bit more critical on, on that particular topic. Uh, security. Um, SE Linux, uh, you, can, you can run it. Uh, one of the problems with it is uh, it causes MongoDB ops that require server-side JavaScript to segfault. So if you're using server-side uh, JavaScript, there's a couple of different uh, uh, Mongo's features that use that then you need to, to uh, go through and disable SE Linux. Uh, you can't even just put it in warning mode or whatever else. You need to disable it altogether. Uh, if you're not using the server-side JavaScript, though, um, there were many counts of people are using SE Linux successfully and stuff like that. Again, make sure you've got, you're putting data someplace abnormal. Make sure you've got rules in place for that and, and, and things. Firewalls. So on a sharded instance, uh, you need to be able to do Mongo's uh, connections to and from the application servers, right? So you're going to be taking incoming connections for the, from the application servers, uh, but you need to be able to do connections back and forth. Uh, you need to be able to do uh, um, connections to and from all the MongoD shards within your, your cluster. Uh, you also need to do, um, uh, I forgot to take this out, the, the Mongos to Mongos. Um, but you need to uh, uh, be able to do connections to your config servers. So I mentioned you have a config cluster. We don't really need to worry about it per for performance, but your Mongoose does use it. You need to be able to connect to it. Uh, and then your MongoD to MongoD inside the replica set, so your shards need to talk to each other. Uh, there are some things they do for balancing and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, from your monitoring admin host, right? You're monitoring this, I hope. Uh, I should have put in there a backup server if you want to backup. But the backup server can be talking to your should be talking to your Mongoose in a sharded uh, cluster. All right. So replica set or standalone, 
Uh, your MongoD is talking to and from the application servers. So again, your application servers are making connections to your MongoDs. Uh, they also talk to other MongoD within the replica set. Uh, and again, you want to be able to connect from your monitoring admin host. Uh, in this particular case, I also need to make sure I sh backup is a different type of admin host to me, but I, you know, I should call it out because your backup server needs to be co coming in as uh, making uh, connections as well. Uh, and then a note. Uh, so before 3.6, MongoD had an extra HTTP interface. So if you're wanting to, to uh, be careful about security, uh, make sure you're looking at that and what, what kind of connections you need to that. Do you mean like running on another port? Running on another port. So whatever port you've got MongoD on, I believe it defaults to plus 1,000. So if you're running on, on port 1,000, it would start an HTTP on port 2,000. Uh, and all the documentation tells you run it on the default part. Don't put MongoD on all the. We're using them all. <laughs> we have we have our bricks running hundreds of of, uh, of containers and a different port for each Mongo, and a different port for each MongoD, and it, it works great. Uh, you just need to make sure you set up your connection strings and your firewalls and, and all that. Uh, RHEL added another feature recently called TuneD or Tuned. I don't know how they they call it because it's plain text. Um, and what the, the purpose of this demon is to go through and look at what's going on on your system and try to make uh, automatic tuning uh, changes to your system. So for kernel tuning and I, uh, uh, networking tuning and so forth. Um, uh, if you want to use that or if you're using RHEL uh, 6 or RHEL or 6 and 7, no, 7 and 8, I remember. Um, but go look up for information on that separately. Uh, I didn't do any, any specific research into, into uh, that. Uh, and then here's some resources, uh, places I get information. The MongoDB documentation is really good. Um, one thing to pay attention to uh, if you're looking at the MongoDB, and this goes for a lot of applications, especially databases, is if you're looking for information specific to a particular version, uh, make sure you're looking at the page for that particular version. So if you're running MongoDB 3.2 and you end up on the 4.2 pages, while 80% of the information is the same, that 20% that, that isn't, isn't the same might be really important for the particular thing you're looking at. All right. Any uh, questions or comments? Yes, Matt. Oh, man, I just missed it. We, we remembered the scheduler, and then I forgot it. Oh. Deadline. Deadline. Deadline, yes. I was right, eight characters. OK. <laughs> but didn't start with a B, so I was, you know, I was half right. All right. So um, yeah, deadline is the is the uh, uh, recommended scheduler uh, for running on bare metal. All right, anything else? No. Well, thank you for coming out tonight.